Good afternoon and thanks for joining us again for the Chatham House COVID-19 webinar series with our distinguished fellow, Professor David Heyman. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about what's going on with access to vaccines uh, with, with a different focus than we had when we talked about the COVAX facility a few months ago. Um, we're going to cover a broad range from what countries are doing outside of COVAX to buy or make their own vaccines, um, how that's going and what's getting in the way um, to vaccine nationalism and vaccine diplomacy. Uh, with us to share their insights into these issues are Helen Rees and David Elwood. Uh, Helen's a professor at the Wittesrand um, University in Johannesburg. She's one of South Africa's powerhouse women scientists. Um, the list of uh, senior advisory roles and board appointments in global health is huge, so I won't go into that. But what I do want to highlight here is that she's been actively involved in the COVID response at the national, regional and global level and is involved at almost all levels in the development of the vaccines, their potential rollout and utilization. Um, David Elwood's a professor of Uni European and Eurasian studies at Johns Hopkins University based in Turin. He's a historian who specializes in the politics of modernization in Europe and in the last decade in the study of soft power. Um, during the pandemic, he's been looking at how countries are using their vaccine supplies as geopolitical instruments to exert influence around the world. So welcome to you both. This should be a really great discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, deal with the housekeeping first, the events on the record as always. And if you'd like to ask questions, please write them in the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, Upvoted questions are more likely to be selected. Um, you can put the questions in any time you want and it can be on any topic. It doesn't have to only be on this topic. So if you have science questions or anything, um, please do go ahead. So um, Helen, I was hoping we could uh, start with you by getting an overview. Um, access to vaccines has been a major focus of discussion at the highest levels around the world. And we have the COVAX initiative, which we are told is the game in town for global access that everyone should get behind as the vehicle. But what's actually happening in reality on the ground with people's experience of access in countries that didn't do advanced deals? And um, is COVAX the only thing that's going on? What else is going on and how are we doing? Well, um, you're quite right. I mean, COVAX is very important, but uh, COVAX hasn't gone at the speed that it would have really liked to go at. Uh, because of being able to access the, the vaccines and also some of the complications such as the liability requirements that uh, countries are required to, to satisfy. So at the moment, uh, the COVAX had only got as far as 39 million, but uh, I mean, the prospects remain good, but there are problems there. Uh, there are several problems. One is the impact of something that we're seeing at the moment in India, where this huge surge of infections uh, has meant that the Indian government has said, look, we need to close our borders to the export of vaccines. So the issue of exporting vaccines and vaccine manufacturers, we saw it right at the beginning of the pandemic when the US wanted to prohibit uh, and buy up uh, products that were made, both vaccines and other products that were made in the United States, thus limiting access to other countries. So, so that is, is one of the problems. Secondly, you're quite right that because countries are scared, even low middle income countries, that they're not gonna get access in, in the way that they really feel they need. There's a lot of bilateral negotiations going on. And the problem with those is that they're often shrouded in secrecy. So we don't know what the cost of the vaccines are when there, there are bilateral negotiations, but we do know in, in one case, for example, the AstraZeneca purchased in South Africa was more expensive than that negotiated by the European Union. So it doesn't necessarily follow in bilateral deals that if you're a low middle income country that you're going to get a more competitive price, but that is sort of, that's really not clear. The third thing is, um, and we often neglect this, I think, is, it's one thing to buy the vaccines and to get the vaccines into the country through whichever route. But the third thing is how, what is the ability of countries to be able to roll out a program? 
These programs are very different to the childhood immunization programs that many countries are familiar with and are good at doing, the EPI programs. These are to adults, to specialized groups, to target populations, perhaps over 60s. These are not people that people have traditionally targeted in many settings. And the cost of those programs is very extensive. In some cases, it can be as much as actually purchasing the vaccines, if not more, because you're putting in place just a new sort of infrastructure. So I think country readiness and countries' abilities to roll out not only in low middle income countries where this is just starting, we've seen it in Europe, the struggles to actually roll out the vaccines, even if you have the vaccines. So I think that uh, at the moment, I would say on a score of one to 10, 10 being very good, where is the world? I think we're about, uh, I, I think we're about three. Some countries have done extremely well, as we know, but I don't think that we're anywhere near yet where we want to do. And just to reinforce what you said, COVAX is incredibly important for low middle income countries. Okay, thank you, Helen. That's, that's quite sobering and, and quite a, a poor score. David Heyman, would you, would you uh, agree with that? Or what's, what's your take on, on where we are and um, whether the world in general is, is delivering on you know, what we've said we all commit to? Or well, those you, who have committed, not everyone's yeah. committed, I guess. You know, Emma, if you look throughout history, um, in recent years, the world has rallied behind access to vaccines for those who need them. This happened first in the smallpox eradication program, which was the first real program to get 100% access to a vaccine that was necessary mm -hmm. for the risk groups. And then the polio eradication program came along. And then there was a, a glitch in the um, getting the availability to pandemic influenza vaccines and a group at WHO, an intergovernmental group developed the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, which has provided vaccines for pandemic influenza, which will provide them from companies to WHO at no cost, uh, about 10% of their production capacity to use in developing countries. So we're making progress. And of course, routine childhood immunizations have always been available through an effort of UNICEF and WHO and many donor countries, including the UK, which has been one of the major contributors to getting vaccines out to children in need. So the world has always rallied behind and I believe that they will rally behind again um, vaccines for COVID, but it's not, it's not easy. Production capacity, as Helen said, is quite low. We're not able to get production that we need because there have been pre-purchase uh, commitments already by many countries to get that vaccine. So production is having trouble meeting global needs. But I think that gradually as time goes on, people are going to see that countries are taking advantage of getting vaccines to people for one of three reasons. Number one, either because the country has humanitarian goals, which many countries do have in their development assistance. Number two is that if they should see in any way that getting vaccines to countries and getting them effectively used decreases the emergence of strains which might be variants and escape vaccines, they would then see an interest nationally in doing it and they might contribute even more. And then finally, I know you're going to talk about this with David later on, is soft power. Countries are actually giving vaccines for soft power. So a short answer to your question, Emma, is that throughout the recent history, there has been a rally behind getting vaccines out to the people who need them. And despite the glitches early on in COVAX, I'm sure that that facility is a step forward in making sure that this will happen over time. Remember, these vaccines have only been available since since really January. Yeah. Okay, thank you, David. Um, Helen, I, I just wondered, particularly in Africa, since that's um, your area, I'm just wondering for country, low and middle income countries that are um, gonna be dependent, that haven't done these advanced deals to, to secure their vaccines, are they happy to wait for COVAX to deliver to them as and when it's their turn or as and when they can get it or are countries taking action for themselves or regional blocks outside of the COVAX. I'm, I'm interested in what's going on outside of COVAX facility. Is there a lot of activity or are pretty, pretty much most people just waiting till COVAX gives them something? 
I mean, I think that's a really important question. And if we look at the African region, in fact, one of the, if there are good things out of COVID, and I think there will be wonderful lessons learned for global health as we go forward. One of them has been in the African region, a real um, sort of call to action around a number of things. One is that unlike when we had pandemic flu in 2009, we don't want to be the region that's left behind with no vaccines. We, we've learned that lesson. Um, so the African Union has really taken up leadership and really started to make demands on a number of fronts. One is uh, to, to say that sort of vaccine nationalism, the, the buying up of vaccines, I think it's about 16% uh, of countries own 53% of vaccines, that that, that is, is not acceptable, that there has to be vaccine sharing. Um, also a demand for manufacturing, that there's very, very little man vaccine manufacturing capacity in the African region, which leaves the region extremely vulnerable. Um, and also some challenges on intellectual property from the African Union as a leader saying that we would like to see through the TRIPS agreement, some of the uh, concessions that are um, provided for by TRIPS that would allow uh, more rapid transfer of technology into the region. <laughs> So from that point of view, the AU, the African Union, has really taken a very strong leadership role. And in addition, they're planning to purchase vaccines and they're doing it in collaboration with COVAX. So it's not a competition. It's to say, how do we do this together? And in fact, COVAX and they are making sure they're not competing for the, for the same vaccine base and making sure that we have rollout. So I think that this is an extremely positive um, uh, sort of development. Okay, speak, speaking of they go, they're trying to buy that, where does the World Bank come into this actually? Because aren't they a player in the access thing out, outside of COVAX, in COVAX, where, where do they fit? I'm not quite sure. In fact, both. So they're working with the COVAX facility um, and with the ACT Accelerator. So, so they're a partner to WHO in those matters, but they've also have put forward, um, uh, I think about 11 billion uh, dollars worth of, of, of money that will support countries. Um, and uh, in addition to vaccine purchasing, I think that there's also discussion about vaccine programs, as I say, because that's an area where we probably globally haven't actually focused enough funding to say to, to countries, you know, how much is this actually going to cost? What is required, you know, in terms of cold chain, supply chains, vehicles, etc. What is actually required? Um, and how are you going to pay for that? Because it, there's a real dollar sign at the end of, of, of a vaccine program. Yeah, I guess getting it in is only the start. I mean, there was one African, what, what was the African country that was going to destroy unused vaccine because they, they didn't use it? Is that because they couldn't roll it out or didn't have the capacity or people didn't want it? I mean, how well, that, widespread is that problem? Yes, no, that was that was actually probably, I think you're referring to what happened in South Africa. So we had imported a million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine and were ready and getting geared up to, to distribute it. And it is a very good vaccine. And then we had two pieces of data that emerged at a time at the beginning of when we were starting to see variants and at the beginning of when we were starting to ask questions about how will those variants impact on the effectiveness of, of, of vaccines that were developed for the original Wuhan strain. And so we had two pieces of data. One was from the laboratory that said that the vaccines appeared, the vaccine appeared to be much less effective against the new variant that had emerged in South Africa. And the other was, well, was and I guess this is a danger of science, it was a very small clinical trial that suggested that the vaccine was not going to be effective against mild to moderate disease. We didn't have data on severe disease in the context of the emerging variant, but based on that, and this was, remember, at the early stage of trying to understand the impact of variants, the health minister felt that it wouldn't be wise to proceed with a vaccine with uncertainty about whether it was going to be effective against the variant. So this vaccine was then redistributed. Yeah, no, I, I think, I, think I was thinking yeah. of a vaccine that was expired and that sat around and didn't get used and it was expired and they were going to chuck it. David, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, that happened in Malawi and it, it happened in a few countries, in fact. And, and the reason I believe, and Helen may be able to say more about this, is the fact that this vaccine is a vaccine for adults. And most countries in Africa have only in the past been giving vaccines either to children or to uh, pregnant women. 
in order that they can prevent neonatal tetanus. And so getting vaccines to adults is a whole new game. And it's very difficult for many countries to figure out how to do this in a way that the adult populations are in fact receptive to the vaccine. But Helen, you may be able to add more to that. No, I think that that's very true. And uh, we might talk about this later on, but in terms of vaccine hesitancy, I don't think that we know how, um, what the demand will be from, from the population. We're talking very much programmatically, how do we get it out to people? But the other question is, how will people who in many cases might never have had a vaccine in their life or might not be aware of that, how, how, how receptive will people be to that? So I think that that's a, a very important question. But on the, on the question of, of expiry dates, the other thing that I, I think we haven't, uh, well, at a country level, wasn't necessarily fully appreciated to begin with, is that early expiry dates for early batches are kind of as long as you can go at that point. And then you keep looking because many of these vaccines are very likely to have a shelf life much longer than was initially anticipated. These are new vaccines, unknown shelf lives. So the manufacturers are looking all the time. And we've already seen that in many cases, those that expiry date is then extended. So, but, but I think that understanding that is people are catching up very quickly, but wasn't necessarily well understood at the beginning of the pandemic when vaccines were first received. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a chicken and egg is, do you give the countries the vaccine if they're not ready to do something with it? Or do you get them ready to receive it before you give it? It's this, yeah, that's an interesting dilemma. Um, I, I wanted to move on, bring um, David Elwood in here talking about another route of access to vaccines and coming back on what Helen, you were saying about um, African Union working in, in cooperation inside and outside COVAX, trying not to compete with them. I'm wondering if some of those vaccines are coming through vaccine diplomacy. Um, are they Chinese vaccines? But um, David, I was hoping you could tell us David Elwood, um, what does soft power mean in the context of the COVID vaccine? And, and how good are vaccines as an instrument of soft power? I mean, talking about the history of soft power as a strategy in general, are vaccines a good candidate for soft power? And yeah. uh, basically what's going on in the moment in this field? And who, yeah, are the I mean big, who are the big soft power wielders and what are they up to? Well, no, I, I use the, the metaphor of currency. Uh, they're a currency of soft power. Like all currencies, they have hard and soft uh, variations, and they're like they're liable to inflation and deflation. Uh, and in fact, we're going through a very severe, severe period of deflation when it comes to the, the currency value of vaccines as soft power. Uh, soft power for me is about the connection between hard power and influence. Hard power being military, uh, economic, political an influence being something which is extremely magmatic and extremely difficult to define. I've got 28 synonyms for influence. Uh, it can, they can be credibility, can be legitimacy, they can be authority, they can be trust, uh, they can be reputation, goodwill, standing, all this kind of stuff. They all come into the, into, into the mixture. Um, in the case, of, in the case of, um, of soft power, I believe that um, in the old days, Nations used to, de, used to enjoy levels of prestige. Uh, and prestige is the antecedent of soft power. But now uh, nations, corporations, churches, and universities, institutions, they all try to manipulate. They all try to manage their reputations. They try to manage their prestige in the world in a very ever more conscious ways and using ever more conscious array of instruments. And the very latest of these is, uh, is, uh, is the vaccine. Where does the, uh, the vaccine fit into this picture? My belief uh, over many years of study is that the most effective, enduring, uh, and incisive uh, form of, um, of uh, soft power is your model of modernity, your models of change, of innovation, of progress. Uh, suddenly, the, and usually these models function over many, many, many decades or years. That's why I talk about the American century. I still believe in the concept of the American century because America has continuously produced models of innovation and change and modernity, uh, which the rest of us have always had to come to terms with. And the latest dramatic case, of course, is the, the, the Super Leagues uh, pushed in football, pushed by these American billionaires and, and the JP Morgan Bank. It's a classic case for me. 
the vaccines are different, uh, different from the Super League, in fact, because uh, they are tactical. They are an innovation which have, has come up extremely rapidly. Uh, well, we know uh, now we know there is a, it's a background, especially in the, in the very interesting Russian case. There is a backing to them. They don't come from just nowhere, but they've come to, uh, to consciousness and they've come into circulation. They've been applied in a very, very short space of time. So the question is whether the soft power mechanism uh, and the soft power idea can be applied in a tactical sense. Uh, that, is the, that is the name of the game. Uh, the, the, key, the, key, the people who really believed in this, in this idea that the, the vaccines could be a currency of soft power in a tactical sense, they were first of all the Chinese, then they were the Russians, uh, and then there were the Indians. You could also include the British in this because uh, at the time that Boris Johnson was proclaiming that Britain should be a science superpower, along comes the AstraZeneca vaccine and he embraces it and, and pushes it exactly as the confirmation of his idea of Britain as a, a soft, as a science superpower. He, he also launched, it should be said back in 2016, that Britain should be a soft power superpower. Uh, and there is quite a lot of people who still still believe in that. In fact, there are much better reasons for believing that than uh, Britain is a science superpower. That's another, another story. No, the key players have, have been China, China, Russia, and India, uh, because they've always accompanied uh, the distribution of vaccines uh, gratis or low cost uh, um, in, in emergency situations. They've always accompanied uh, these efforts uh, with high faluting principles, with high sounding principles of morality. This is humanitarian. This is the, uh, the hand of friendship. This is our, uh, our, uh, our gesture to, um, to world, uh, world well-being. If, uh, we're only safe if we're all safe. This is the language they use when they uh, subscribe to COVAX. That's the language they use when they give uh, vaccines to underdeveloped countries, including, it must be said, uh, um, South Africa. As I understand, the vaccine that came to South Africa were, in fact, Indian uh, uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, and I'm sure Helen can confirm or deny that. But they, the point is this, that they were always accompanied by these very high sounding principles of, of humanity and interest and, uh, and well-being. Um, and in fact, uh, the Chinese have gone furthest in this by, by apparently shifting health diplomacy, the health diplomacy in the wiser sense, to the center of the famous Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and so wherever the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, has taken root, there you will also find the, the Chinese making uh, big gestures uh, and big displays of their efforts with vaccines, for instance, in, uh, in, in Northern Africa, Northeast Africa, uh, in parts of Central and Eastern Europe, parts of Latin America, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the question is whether this tactical, this tactical, these tactical maneuvers will work. Right now, there are no, this is a competitive game, make no mistake, this is a competitive game for influence. The question is, uh, who's winning now? My answer is nobody's winning right now because uh, shadows have come over all these, these efforts um, uh, in, in all kinds of ways. Above all, you need to have a vaccine which is guaranteed to be effective. Uh, and that means not simply in medical terms, but as Helen made very clear, rollout. Your, your rollout has to be, has to be effective. Uh, to what extent the Russians and the Chinese can actually influence rollout on, on the ground, that's, that's something which is not entirely clear. Certainly the Chinese have been trying to do that in places like Ethiopia and other zones of Northeast, Northeast Africa. I think the Indians probably did it in the early phases when they were handing out vaccines to all their neighborhood, all the way around from the Maldives uh, to, to Myanmar, <coughs> to Nepal, even to Pakistan at one stage, Sri Lanka and so on and so forth. I don't know what extent they, they yeah, have. No, I, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> what, are they, what are they really after? I mean, are we talking about what, what can we look forward to as, as the consequence of all this soft power, if it works, and, and they do, the you know, What's the quid pro quo? Are they? Are we talking about access to mines, support at the UN? Um, you know, what kind of favors are being exchanged, or deal deals are being made in exchange for these vaccines? And if this goes at a big scale, um, 
you know, what impact will that have on geopolitics and the whole balance of power? I mean, surely this is, they must be focusing on areas or locations where Western influence is waning or is, is a little bit disabled or weak so they can move in there. I, you know, where, how do they decide who to give it to? I, I understand the, the Russians are planning to supply vaccine to about 70 countries, the Chinese to about 90. How are they selecting them and what do they want in exchange and what is, what's the world going to look like as a result of this vaccine diplomacy? Well, I'm, quite frankly, it's too soon to tell. Uh, I, I would have given you a different answer if, I, uh, if you'd asked the question in January or February. It would have been much more, much more specific, much more precise. Uh, because it seemed as though the vaccines were working, first of all, that they were effective. Uh, now a, a shadow has come over all of them in one way or another. Uh, there are doubts about the, the effectiveness of the Chinese vaccine, this, uh, as the population of Chile has discovered. Uh, the Russian vaccine is in a special category because uh, not only do they push their vaccine, which isn't, isn't con 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 to the others, isn't available in such huge numbers compared to what China and India promised in the, in the early stages. Um, it's also accompanied by a huge disinformation effort. Uh, and so they can, haven't been able to resist the temptation to accompany their vaccine diplomacy with disinformation efforts against other people's vaccines. Uh, and the State Department has now, has now recognized this and denounced this. Uh, the trolls, uh, the, the fake news, uh, the bad mouthing of other people's vaccines, that's not gonna help the Russians either in the short, medium, long term, when it comes to having soft power influence. When it comes to India, obviously, uh, their, their effort in this direction has collapsed in flames, uh, uh, almost literally. Uh, and that's, that has completely undermined their, uh, their authority and their, their possibilities of gaining influence in, in this sense. Where does this leave the others? Uh, there, it should be said that, that uh, there is certainly a lot of risk among the experts that where India is failing right now, the Chinese will move in uh, and the Chinese will take advantage of India's chaos uh, in places where they're already established in Pakistan. But they may even uh, try to move into, into places like Nepal, to places like Myanmar uh, and establish a, a health presence there uh, and take advantage of India's disarray. Um, where does that leave the others, uh, the Europeans, the Americans? The Americans are playing a very strange game. It's not clear. They don't have a strategy when it, uh, of vaccine diplomacy uh, right now. They seem to be improvising uh, initiatives as they go along. They've given vaccines to Mexico. They've given vaccines to Canada. They've given vaccines to COVAX. Uh, they're talking about uh, a special emergency effort in favor of India and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not clear at all. The Europeans, they too, well, you see, Europe is a special case because, uh, because uh, everybody considers the EU to be a soft power operation far, you know, far more than anything else uh, over the, uh, in the grand strategic uh, picture. Uh, and uh, people talk about the Brussels effect uh, and the, way, the lead they're trying to establish when it comes to green, the, uh, the greening of the world and uh, on the, the, the battle against uh, the regulation of tech giants. Uh, all this is in areas where areas where the, uh, the Europeans have been making strategic efforts, EU has been making strategic efforts. But when it comes to the vaccines, they've been caught short. Uh, and the EU has shown it's completely unprepared to uh, tackle an emergency like this, procure large, quanti huge quantities of stuff in a very short space of time. Uh, the but the question you asked is, what, what do these countries expect to gain from these kind of efforts? Uh, in the short, medium, or long term, <clears throat> what 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 kind of influence are we talking about here? Uh, what kind of soft power? Well, if you establish a permanent presence of health diplomacy, you can alter the the image and the standing uh, and authority of your nation in the world, especially in this sector. Cuba is a classic example. Cuba has doing, been doing health diplomacy for over sixty years, uh, well over sixty years. And they have an established presence and established authority in this area of doing, of sending medical teams and sending medicines and sending nurses and sending bits of hospital equipment to various places in the, in the third world. And they have an established authority and status and prestige uh, in that area, built up over many decades. 
if the others, the other players in the game, uh, the Chinese, uh, the Russians, the Europeans, uh, the Americans too, want to build up uh, this kind of status, this kind of authority, this kind of prestige, they will have to uh, prove that they are willing to commit resources over the long term to change the picture, the health picture, the balance of power in health sectors uh, in, in the various countries they decide to move into. Central Europe, you know, Central Europe is a fascinating case. This is my, where my colleague, Sir Michael Lee, who's been active, you know, who's going to win the battle for influence in Hungary, uh, in Bulgaria, in the Balkans, in the Balkans, uh, in, in Poland, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Belarus and Ukraine. This, this is, these are contested areas, probably the area which is the most, sees the most intense competition for geopolitical influence. So any instrument that can be useful in this sort of confrontation is, is embraced with enthusiasm by the various protagonists. And so Hungary, the, the Hungarian Prime, uh, Prime Minister Orban, he got himself injected with a Chinese vaccine. Uh, and the Serbian uh, Prime Minister President is saying, I can offer my, my citizens uh, the Chinese version, the Russian version, the Western, any Western version you want. This is him offering uh, you know, this is a great offer. The Western Balkans is looking very weak. The, West, the, the, the people in, in Bosnia and um, Herzegovina and Albania and so on are complaining very bitterly that the EU is letting them down uh, and, and the, try, the amount of stuff that uh, is being sent is, is tiny. So naturally, along come the Russians and along come the, along come, uh, the Chinese and everybody else. A, a, a zone of very intense geopolitical in, uh, competition, where that sort of the current that sort of currency of power can really make make a difference. Over the long term, it's 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 very hard to say right now. It really depends on whose vaccines turn out to be the most effective in terms of fighting fighting the disease uh, and uh, and uh, covering uh, uh, the large majority of the population. Uh. Okay, that's a, that's a lot to think about. David and, and Helen, I just wondered whether either of you are at all concerned about vaccine diplomacy as a practice. I mean, as far from a public health point of view, does it really matter why countries are engaging in this way or doing vaccine diplomacy? But, um, uh, you know, if, if they're giving access and they're building manufacturing facilities and teaching, um, the recipient countries, how to make vaccine. As public health practitioners, do we care that they're getting some influence for it? Uh, must be good for public health. I mean, other than the reports of disinformation. Um, do you have any concerns about vaccine diplomacy and how it's playing out from a public health standpoint or an access standpoint? David, do you want to go first? Uh, which, okay. which David? Oh, Heyman, Heyman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think Helen can speak better to this than I can. But, you know, there is a World Health Organization and they do review all vaccine information and they give emergency use licenses if necessary. And as long as the vaccine goes through that process, I think we can be sure that that vaccine is a vaccine which is suitable for use in most countries. I think I'm going to defer though to Helen to talk about that process that's done in the SAGE and where things stand with that, because that to me is the key. If WHO has said, yes, this vaccine is a vaccine which is useful and effective, then the next step is to make sure that it's available by any means. So I'll defer to Helen on the rest. Helen. Thank you. No, I. I uh... So I, I, it's not only WHO, but I mean, again, you know, if good can, can, can come from this pandemic, one of the, the, the things that is emerging is the importance of uh, national regulatory authorities and also sub-regional efforts between regulatory authorities. Um, and this is becoming even more important when you think about the emergence of variants that come to dominate sub-regional areas quite quickly. Uh, because what everyone wants to know is, you know, is the vaccine safe and effective, but is it going to be effective in my context with my particular pattern of variance, whatever that might be? And, and, to, and that's a regulatory question. 
The other thing that's a regulatory question um, is, is uh, the quality of manufacturing. And I think that this is you know, now coming out, a lot of people are talking and understanding the importance of the quality of manufacturing. So in terms of your question, does it matter? At a national level, if the national regulator and if it's a, a, an empowered and well-resourced national regulator, many, many are not, and they benefit from regional uh, collaborations with other regulatory authorities. But if that is approved um, and seen as, as, as something that's, that, that's good, good manufacture, it's sufficiently effective, safe within the parameters that we, we're, we're, we're looking at for safety, is it, if all of those things are ticked, then a country will say that, that that's fine. And I think we should actually be very, very open to this. I, I, I really don't think that we should be in any way closed. I hear about the soft power, but at the moment, the world needs vaccines. We need to, to have a level playing field and to look at uh, all vaccines, you know, uh, through, the same, through the same lens of WHO, regulatory authorities, programmatic suitability, can we roll them out? Is it a single dose? Is it two doses? That's what we need to be asking at a national level. And the rest, I think politicians will be sensitive to, and of course there will be the soft, the soft diplomacy behind it. But I think that uh, the, the real question is, do the vaccines work? Are they fit for purpose? Can I, can I just come in here? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree. And in fact, that was my conclusion too in the end. But we just had a very interesting case. Uh, there are two cases I would like to mention. Uh, first of all, Serbia, uh, Belgrade. Uh, the biggest Confucius in Institute in Europe is going to be built in Belgrade, Confucius Institute. Uh, uh, and it's going to be built on the site of the US embassy that was bombed by NATO in, 19, uh, in 1999. Huge symbolic meaning. Uh, does it matter uh, that uh, the Chinese are penetrating, uh, penetrating Serbia in this way? Well, uh, certainly if they get together with the Russians in that part of the world and really start making trouble, then it does matter. That remains to be seen. Uh, so uh, uh, their vaccine deployments in that part of the world has a very significant, obvious geopolitical meaning. Uh, the, a more interesting case is, is um, what happened in the Rome region, Lazio, uh, there was an article by the, about this in, in, on Politico.eu yesterday, uh, in which they, uh, they, uh, they demonstrated the success of the vaccine rollout in that region of Italy. <clears throat> and there's been enormous disparity between the regions. Uh, it was largely because uh, the, the key people in, in Lazio, in Rome, consulted the Israelis. They consulted the Israelis uh, and they brought in Israeli experts uh, to show how it can be done, because Israel has obviously had one of the most successful rollouts anywhere, uh, and that transformed their idea of their idea of how to how to how to carry on, how to get organised, and how to make it work. Well, uh, that the government of the the Lazio region is a centre left uh, left government, but you cannot imagine the regional authorities in northern Italy, which are run by right wing populist governments, ever turning to a foreign, a foreign government, a foreign agency for advice. It doesn't matter if it's Israel or whether it's talking about Ecuador or anybody else. Uh, that populist impulse, we do it alone, we are our, ourselves alone. Uh, that, has, that has consequences even in this kind of sector. Uh, and uh, we had Francis Fukuyama uh, on the Johns Hopkins um, platform uh, on Monday night. And he uh, produced a piece of research which he said there's a definite, a definite correlation between the domination of populist politics uh, in any particular region or country and the, the weakness of the vaccine rollout, the weakness of the vaccine strategy. Uh, that one of his political science colleagues has been able to, to demonstrate fairly conclusively that, that conclusion, that correlation, uh, and that's certainly the case in, in Northern Italy, which is run by populist, the populist, the one single populist party, the Northern League, from the Western Alps all the way through to the Dolomites. Uh, so, so it sounds like it can be good for public health, but also have far reaching other effects that are very important as well. Um, I'm gonna move on to um, audience questions now. And the most upvoted question is from Ashley Furlong from Politico, actually, you have having just mentioned 
an article on Politico, um, a question on India. And David Heyman, I was hoping you could take this one first. Um, are vaccines the way out of the crisis in India? And should other countries be donating vaccines to India or instead be giving them to places where hardly any jabs have been distributed? Well, you know, I'll, the answer to that is that we have seen an incredible development of vaccines, of diagnostic tests, and of some understanding of how to best treat people with infection. So all of these play a role in India as they do elsewhere. India has not been able to vaccinate its population, its population at risk of serious illness. And as a result, they're having serious illness. It's too late now to vaccinate those people. What's important in India now is number one, to get the, the oxygen, the ventilators and the dexamethasone, if not available and other drugs, which can be used to treat the people who are infection, understanding that in areas where that crisis is not occurring and it's only major in urban areas right now from my understanding, they need to begin to set up the, the infrastructure to deliver vaccines in the future. And of course, they need to be using testing and in areas where there isn't a lot of transmission, begin to do some contact tracing to do good epidemiology and stop the small outbreaks that are occurring so they don't spread into larger community transmission. So there's no one answer for India. It depends uh, on where you are. But the major urgency now is to get the disease under control because the prevention measures have not worked. I think Helen might have some other additions to that. Helen? Um, so, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that had India had the capacity to roll out vaccines, it might well not be in the situation that it's in now. Um, but, you know, that wasn't to be the case. Uh, I, I do think that now with the, um, the request by, by the Prime Minister Modi that Serum Institute, for example, should not export until the Indian population has got substantial coverage in terms of vaccination. This is, this is going to have a, a global impact. I agree with David, though, that the, the rules of epidemiology still apply. And in, even in a big country like India, you know, you are getting these, these different patterns in different areas, and the response should be tailored to that. Uh, but at the moment, the urgency is certainly treatment. Uh, that, that's the urgency. But vaccines need to follow very, very closely. The other thing we should just remember that is an unknown for India at the moment is, is uh, there is a variant there that's been identified with three major mutations. It's called the B1617. Um, but uh, what we don't know is, is that the dominant variant in the country or are there lots of different variants playing out? We also don't know what the response of the vaccines that will be used, you know, what, what will be the immune response to those vaccines in terms of this emerging problem. So once again, you know, there's a mixture of program, science, readiness, um, but at also the challenge of this emerging science that shifts the goalposts all the time. But I certainly think that I agree with David, in a parallel to treatment, I would be strongly and rapidly um, trying to prepare for a, a really accelerated vaccine rollout. Emma, just to add on to that, India has been one of the major countries that's been sequencing, that's doing the genetic sequencing of polio virus. And they have a great understanding of genetic sequencing. They have all the skills that are necessary in a country to do a very good job with this. The problem is that there's a lack of coordination. It's a very big country, as we all know. It's a lot of the power in health has been decentralized to the state level. And it's very difficult for a central government to coordinate state governments when they have a decentralized power. So there same are many in Italy, reasons. Absolutely the same in yeah. Italy, exactly the yeah. same. Yeah. And that's what happens when these decentralizations occur and you lose the lever that you had earlier on when you were centralized to make things work in harmony. So it's a big issue for, for uh, India. Uh, but D David, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is going off is related to what you're saying, but I've heard you say many times before that fighting the pandemic shouldn't be a centralized top-down thing. It has to be a bottom-up and 
a very local thing, shouldn't that be an advantage in India and in a place like Yes, it, it should be an advantage everywhere. The good response comes from community level and communities need to understand how to, how to help their people do their own risk assessment and how to protect others and protect themselves. What we've seen in this outbreak, surprisingly, is a top-down approach where, where physical distancing has not been instilled in populations so that they're empowered to do this themselves. It's been a centralized lockdown, forced physical distancing, which disempowers people and which makes them ill fit when the lockdown is over to really do their own risk assessments and to begin to contribute to stopping transmission. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna take the next question now. The next most upvoted question is from Charles Clift and it's going back to intellectual property again. Um, is the TRIPS waiver proposed by India and South Africa a good solution to expanding production and global access to vaccines? So um, whoever wants to take that first, if for this audience who are not all as, may not all be as up on TRIPS flexibilities, et cetera, as Charles is, could we start by a little bit of introduction on what's TRIPS and how it relates to this, just, just to, um, for a bit of inclusion in, in a broader audience. Thanks, who wants to take this first? Helen, you're, you're looking ripe for this question. I'm certainly not a TRIPS expert, but um, uh, I, I will share with you what I know and what I think. So under the World Trade Organization is, this, is the, the TRIPS agreement, which is trade-related intellectual property rights. Um, but written into that, uh, and, and this is really to have global standards around, amongst other things, around respect for intellectual property and et cetera. But under that, there are waivers that can be um, put into place. And those waivers are particularly when there is something like a global emergency. And so India and South Africa, I think they were supported by about 100 countries in this request, um, asked that, that, that these waivers should be enacted to allow um, a freeing up of, of exchange of technology. Um, and uh, in, in particular with things like copyright, industrial design, patents. Uh, these were some of the things that they said, and, and only for the duration of the pandemic. And particularly around, I think particular concern was vaccines, but in fact, I mean, it went, went, went broader and obviously would include other uh, therapeutics and, and medicines. Now, the, 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 counter, the counter argument is that it wouldn't do anything at the moment. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And even if we did that, would we be able to transfer um, IP in, 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 in the sort of speed that's required? And it, is this you know, kind of the wrong moment to have this discussion? That's one of the arguments that's coming from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the counter counter to that is, is, well, actually, we've already seen that there are examples where having intellectual property has had an impact on things like access to diagnostics, um, on access to, to, to therapeutics such as remdesivir. So there are counter arguments that are saying, but we've already seen that IP, the conservation of IP and the fa failure to share has had an impact. I think that um, you know, whether it's now or in the longer term, one of the things that we did with this, with the conservation of intellectual property around the HIV AIDS crisis was in fact to, to look at some waivers and the transfer of intellectual property to uh, low middle income country uh, manufacturers so that antiretrovirals could be made much more, more wide, widely available. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to win this particular argument now in the context of this pandemic, but I think it's an extremely serious argument because if we have waivers for a global emergency in the TRIPS agreement and we fail to put them into place and big countries with big pharmaceutical, who are the home to big pharmaceutical manufacturers are the ones that are saying we don't want to do this. We have to then re-ask ourselves, what is the point of having these global agreements if we're not going to honor them, particularly in the context of a pandemic? And if they're not fit for purpose, what would be fit for purpose that would allow a freer exchange of, of technology, of access, of manufacturing? If this isn't fit for purpose, what would be? And I think that's going to be a medium term discussion. And also, if you're not going to enact waivers for something like this, 
how desperate does a situation have to get? I guess that's related, maybe similar flip side of what you're saying that, you know, if this doesn't do it and make the case for, we really need to do this. Do, do, do any of you know what is actually going on and what are the prospects of this actually happening? How much progress? You said we're probably not going to win on this, but is it being taken seriously or is it being dismissed or where are we with it? David? Well, there, there has already been licensing of the AstraZeneca vaccine to uh, producers in India. And those producers are producing the vaccine under standard good practice and in a vaccine that's licensable. So it has occurred to a certain extent. Whether it will occur, I think Kellen has been clear, whether or not it will extend to other vaccines, especially those vaccines with the newer technologies is not clear. And if it doesn't work, then there has to be a re-examination of why it didn't work and how we can make it work better in the future. You know, WHO one time tried to have a commission. I think uh, there were some of the people who were listening in were leading that commission to try to see if there could have been a replacement for intellectual property that would ensure the innovation that occurs from innovation from intellectual property. And to my understanding, that never really did result in another mechanism, but there's still work on that being gone underway to make sure that we don't let this problem just fall by the wayside. There's the patent pool. There are other uh, areas of work also. There's work on, on taking away the marketing of products from the development. So all of these things may in the future lead to a better way of doing research and development. Maybe the public sector taking a risk while the private sector putting its in, in, in its innovative skills with the risk funding from the governments to make things work in a better way. Okay, before I bring David Elwood on this, because I would imagine that um, opening up intellectual property rights would not be good for those holding uh, vaccine soft power, because uh, that kind of dilutes their power if, if everyone can make their own <laughs> vaccines. But David, I'm not sure the question's clear. Maybe I, I'd kind of zoned, zoned out, I hope not, of is, is a TRIPS waiver a good solution to expanding access to COVID vaccines or not? Are you asking me? No, sorry, David Heyman. Before I move on to David Elwood on the... If it works, it's a good mechanism. Helen, is it a good solution? Yeah, I mean, it's there for a, a global emergency, and this is a global emergency. Uh, and, and David's quite right. AstraZeneca have done this, so it can be done. And clearly, one of the big challenges at the moment is vaccine manufacturing capacity. That's a big global challenge. And, and you know, we're, 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 we are... Um, we, we're slowing up in terms of our ambitions of vaccine coverage, partly because of manufacturing capacity. And so if this will help that, I don't see why if AstraZeneca could do it, why it cannot be considered. And it can be limited. It can be for the duration of the pandemic. And it can be very targeted, for example, at vaccines. Thank you. D David Elwood, what I wanted to ask you, maybe this is a tiny bit of a stretch too far, but... <coughs> Are there interests for um, the vaccine soft power wielders to oppose something like this? So say China or in not necessarily India, but China or, or Russia that may not want countries widely, far and wide to be able to make their own vaccine. Do, do they have an interest in opposing this or is it really a minor? Well, I, 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 have, I, have, power? I haven't seen any evidence on that question uh, in, in the media I've been reading. Uh, uh, intellectual property rights, copyright and patents are obviously currencies of soft power and, and there are great, really large lobbies which are organized in order to, to defend them and to pre protect them as such. Uh, what needs, what I think what needs to be said in this context is that one of the great bugbears uh, in the relationship between the US and China, between the Western China, is because uh, the Chinese appear to systematically steal intellectual property in all kinds of fields, in all kinds of, over all kinds of periods. Uh, and uh, whether uh, and how and when their uh, vaccine has been developed, that to me still remains a mystery, uh, how they actually did it, uh, with whose technology, where their own and in native or whatever. Um, and so what their attitude to this would be, a waiver, uh, would be extremely interesting to see. This is not the case in Russia. At least I don't expect it to be the case in Russia. Uh, 
there's a fascinating podcast uh, on the New York Times website where, which talks about the, the Russian history of vaccines. And it's the, it's the most detailed description I've seen yet uh, of just how strong the Russian tradition in vaccine production is going all the way back to the beginning of the revolution uh, when the country was faced with a, an outbreak of bubonic plague. And ever since then, they have been developing, a, a, over many decades, a very strong capacity for in, in developing uh, and producing and distributing vaccines. Uh, so I wouldn't have thought that they would be caught up in this, in this question about, about intellectual property, not on this front perhaps on others, but it's it's worth checking out. I do not, I can't tell you what they're- It'll be interesting to see if it com comes to anything. Um, China's getting... the key question. China's the key to this. China's the key. Okay. Um, <coughs> we're getting quite close to time. So I think David Heyman, Heyman I'm gonna give you the last question and it's the most upvoted by quite a mile from Sonia uh, Miri. What risk does vaccine diplomacy pose um, to long-term global health security? And anyone else is welcome to come in after that. We have time. David Heyman. Well, that vaccine diplomacy with vaccines that are effective and properly regulated can be a great boon to health security. They can help countries develop their own health security by using those vaccines. And they can also, if countries are uh, able to provide some production facilities to produce vaccines should they need them. So my answer to that, and I'm gonna to turn to Helen, but my answer is that vaccines can only strengthen health security in the long run. Does anybody else wanna come in for a last word before I wrap up? Well, perhaps just one thing, um, you know, if, if diplomacy, if vaccine diplomacy in this case, improves public health in the short term during a pandemic, then provided all those caveats about quality are in place, then it should be welcomed. And I'm just reminded, we shouldn't forget one of the most powerful vaccine diplomacy efforts has been the PEPFAR program for, for HIV and AIDS, which has been done through the United States. Um, and uh, we, we often don't think about that in the same manner. Um, but I think in the long run, it, 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 what we're looking for, I think, is more autonomy and more ability to manufacture locally um, and a, a much more equitable distribution of manufacturing uh, ability and of science, by the way. We shouldn't forget science. I mean, we shouldn't just say LMICs and low middle income countries are, are always the recipient of science. They can also be the inventor of science. And that's what we should also be encouraging. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give one more question to David Elwood. Um, and this is from uh, Richard Lucas. When low and middle income countries accept soft power gifts of vaccine, um, could this undermine their national security? Um, or this could undermine their national security? Should COVAX consider national security when deciding which countries they distribute vaccines to? So I guess that is in order to counteract any nefarious vaccine diplomacy that may be going on. Um, the first part of the question for David Elwood, second part for David and Helen, that'll be the last question. Yeah, well, the virus doesn't respect national security at all. Uh, and um, I would say that everybody uh, can, uh, all nations must now realize that um, their, their health security depends on other people uh, just as much as it does on, um, on themselves. And we're all in favor of autonomy, uh, but the global, the global nature of this, uh, of this pandemic, uh, I think has been absolutely extraordinary and has struck everybody and has reinforced the need for much stronger global government, uh, reinforcing the WHO or that part of the UN, the COVAX, whatever. COVAX should not be just be a one-off event it should become, uh, to me, institutionalized through WHO or wherever. It's never been clearer the need for some form of world, uh, ever stronger world government uh, to manage these, these emergencies. Okay, thank you, David. Should COVAX be selecting countries? Should national security or, or international security be at all a part of how they select whose turn comes first as far as getting vaccine to fend off other influences in that country. 
Well, I think that COVAX has a governance mechanism which reviews the plans of countries when they submit them for vaccination. And that's taken care of in those governing um, selection process, the governing body in the selection process. I've spoken with people who have done that selection process and they're very sure, they're, they, they try to be very sure that when vaccine requests come in, there's government commitment behind those requests, as well as a strategy that is feasible in getting the vaccines to the people who need them. So I think we can be sure that with COVAX, and maybe Helen will say a little bit more or some other point of view on this, but that's my view, that there is a mechanism in place to make sure that when countries request vaccine, it's a legitimate vaccine with government backing and the possibility of success. So um, just to, to build on that, you know, COVAX, um, is, I, I think the success of COVAX is going to be very strongly around its ability to deliver vaccines to the 90 to what are called AMCs, these uh, countries, which are the, the poorest or the most vulnerable or the smallest countries that don't have muscle and negotiating power or finances themselves and will be supported by uh, development aid. Um, and, and, and it's an incredibly ambitious program, but it is we shouldn't forget it's built on the back of Gavi. And Gavi has been truly one of the most successful global programs in terms of ensuring access to vaccines, particularly for childhood immunization programs, um, uh, for the, again, for the poorest countries. So uh, I, I must say, I, um, I think that COVAX uh, has to be backed with finances and with vaccines. It has to be backed with support for program delivery. Um, and we shouldn't, we haven't discussed it, but we shouldn't forget that it has to be backed by community demand. So we have to do our work to actually persuade communities that these are vaccines that they understand and that are beneficial for them. And, and it shouldn't, it should be permanent. It not, shouldn't just die away when the pandemic finishes. Oh, that's a whole nother webinar, David. We're not <laughs> going there right now. So on that note, I'm going to wrap up, but that is a very interesting Point, and I know I've discussed that with Helen before as to you know, decisions to be made as to whether we keep COVAX going or what do we do with it or you know, how, do, how do we leverage it and, and have build something for the future. Um, but, th but we're going to stop now because I've got over time, naughty. Um, but thank you very much, all three of you, and uh, particularly to our guests, David, uh, Elwood and Helen. Uh, for joining us and sharing your insights for a great, great conversation. I feel there's so much I wanted to dig up more that we didn't get to on, you know, the spread of counterfeit vaccines and um, more on nationalism and Europe. And anyway, um, hopefully another time. But thank you so much for joining us. And um, David and I will be back again. I'm not quite sure our dates, but we'll be back discussing more hot topics. So just look out for what's coming up. And thank you all for joining us and bear with him, uh, bearing with me and letting me go over by four minutes. So have a great rest of the day and thank you all very much. Great pleasure. Thanks, bye. Great pleasure, bye.